All right, <coughs> let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we gather together this morning, Lord, to see you glorified, Lord, to see you for who you are, pray that you'd reveal yourself through your word to us this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts and to our minds, that you would minister to us the things that we need to know this day. Things, Lord, that may be familiar to us, Lord, but remind us of the importance of them and impact our lives fresh and new, Lord, with the power of your word. So speak to us from your word this morning as we commit this time to you. We pray your blessing on it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, open your Bibles, if you would, to uh, Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And a message entitled, Real Sacrifice. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever sacrificed something? I'm not talking about animal sacrifices on the grill in the backyard during the summertime. Not that kind of sacrifice. But have you ever given up something because you felt or saw the need to give up something? Or sacrificed something? And, and then really, honestly, if we're going to use the word sacrifice, what, what did you ever really give up, honestly? You know, we're Americans in the 21st century. What have you ever really, really had to give up? What did you really suffer for the sake of sacrificing really anything. The idea of sacrificing yourself or something that is dear to you for something else, that is a concept that is as old as humanity, really. There have been people that have made sacrifices for good causes, bad causes, for right things or wrong things throughout uh, all of history. So it's not necessarily that. But when we get to where we are in our text now, which is the Garden of Gethsemane, we see something far beyond just a mere sacrifice. Somebody just sacrificing something for someone else. It's, it appears when we, when we look at Jesus in the Garden, it appears to be the burden of the whole world, not just a sacrifice. See, when God created man, he put him in a garden. And when sin entered the world, it was in a garden. And then man was cast out of the garden. And here, it's in a garden that the time has come for the restoration of man to God's garden begins. Let's take a look at our text this morning, Luke chapter 22, picking it up in verse 39 down to verse 46. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples were followed, or also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Here in the final hours of Jesus' earthly life, it seems as if everything takes on a special significance. I mean, all, every one of God's words, Genesis to Revelation, has special significance. But there's a certain kind of a pathos to this, these moments where Jesus is uh, in the garden and he's praying and the, the actions and the reactions of the disciples. Uh, there, there's just a different tone to these moments. These are the last hours of Jesus' life. At this moment, the last minutes before his arrest, leading to the trials, his torture, then his crucifixion. Uh, we see, um, well, we know the rest of the story. Okay, we know what's going to happen. 
Uh, but if we can just for a few moments just pause here in the garden and just try our best to get some sort of a grip on the things that are going on here in the garden, um, we know the rest of the story. But his disciples didn't. Even up to this moment, his disciples, I see them as being, you know, gee, Jesus, a little heavy this evening. I mean, you okay? I mean, you know, what, what's going on? I mean, in spite of the fact that he had told them what was going to happen repeatedly, but still they weren't quite grasping everything that was going on. So Jesus warns them about some of these things. We see, uh, you know, the drama of the betrayal. Judas Iscariot at the table with Jesus dipping his hand into the same bowl as Jesus. And Jesus saying, the one that dips his hand in the bowl with me is the one that's going to betray me. And the rest of the disciples clueless as to who was betrayed. Betrayed what? For what? How, who? Who would do something like that? You see, the heartbreak of Peter's denial is, you know, boastful as, Lord, all of these are going to deny you, but not me. I'm your man, not going to betray you. Them, betrayal. Me, no betrayal. Okay? And, and we know what's going to happen because that's precisely what he's going to do. You see, the fear of the disciples when Jesus is arrested and everybody scatters and, and leaves Jesus on his own. But what we need to see more than anything else, what you need to focus your attention on this morning is the sacrifice of God's Son as a payment for your sins and for mine. Let's take it apart like this. Point number one is temptation in the garden. Temptation in the garden. Now, all four Gospel accounts uh, have an account of what transpires here in the garden. You can read about it, and I'm going to refer to some of these. Uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 to 46. Mark 14, 32 to 42. John 18, 1 through 11. I'm going to be touching on all four accounts here in the next couple of weeks. And when we harmonize all four accounts, we can kind of see the whole picture, because they all record something slightly different from the other. A Jesus goes out, as it says here in verse 39, to a familiar place. This is some place that they frequented throughout Jesus' ministry, so uh, they go to a familiar place. Interestingly enough, um, as Jesus knows that Judas is going to betray him, Jesus doesn't really do anything different. Jesus doesn't go into hiding. He doesn't slip away someplace. Uh, he goes to the familiar place. He makes it easy for them to find him. In other words, you know, Jesus, if you, if you want to be found, go and do your same routine things in the familiar places, and he does. So he goes to a familiar place, and he takes from there, as Matthew chapter 26, verse 37 tells us, as they pause, he takes his three <coughs> closest disciples. I choose to look at them and see them as his three closest friends. That even within the twelve, there were three that were his closest. And, and he takes them... Uh, a short distance to pray. But before he goes off with those three, and then he pauses and then takes a few steps further beyond those three, he pauses to say to all of them here in verse 40, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now, this is an interesting thought. As he tells them and warns them to pray so that you will not enter into temptation, he is about to pay the price for their failure to do so. Think about that. He warns them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And yet, that is exactly what he's paying for. Their failure in giving into temptation. So as he warns them that temptation is in that garden, think about that. When he warns them that temptation is in that garden, he takes his three closest friends to pray privately. Peter, James, and John, you know these guys, James and John being brothers, Peter, the rock, uh, they've been with Jesus on some other previous private moments. Very unique situations, like for instance, in Luke chapter 8, verses 41 to 56, he takes him in and when he raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. What a thing to be a witness of. Come here, you guys. I want to show you something. I'm going to raise this girl from the dead. How about his transfiguration, Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 36. 
they were his closest friends, his closest confidants, and for some reason he wanted them to be a witness of these things. And when it comes time in his life, when his soul is grieved, as one of the other gospel accounts is grieved with sorrow, he says, I want you guys to be with me in that moment. In the moment that things are the, the absolute darkest for me, I want you three guys to be there with me. Now, did they fully comprehend what Jesus meant by that or what he needed from them? I, I doubt it. Because he caught them sleeping three times. It's sleeping from sorrow, so it says. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Now, when things are difficult, when things were difficult for Jesus, he called his three closest friends. When things are difficult for you and for me, it's a very valuable thing to have friends that will stand with you, or in this case, kneel with you through your pain, whatever your pain might be. I know that the, the morning that Carol passed away, I called my closest friends here. I called Barry and Barb, I called Jane Lynn, I called Rich and Jill. And they were all there with me, they were there with me through the whole thing anyways. But to be able to have people like that in your life that you can call upon, and I'm not just talking about my buddies, I'm talking about spiritual co-laborers. I'm talking about people not only that I know and love and respect, but people that I know know and love and respect me. It, again, these are, it, it's not necessarily my buddy buddies. My, these are the people I want to go roller skating with on the weekend, although I would love to do that. <laughs> I would love to do that. <laughs> I'm talking about people that are not afraid to get down and get their hands dirty in the, the mess that might happen to be my life. Some of you that uh, share... Uh, Facebook with me. Now, I posted something here last week um, that I've said 10,000 times here, you've heard me say it, and that is, uh, you know, God's business is people business, and people business is messy business. And what makes a friend is someone who's not afraid to roll up their sleeves and get their hands dirty in the mess that happens to be my life. And here Jesus calls on his three closest friends to come and to be with him. I see, again, this incredible pathos. This is such a moment of such deep and abiding emotion that as I, I'm even preparing this message, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little misty-eyed as I'm preparing this, just thinking about Jesus in the garden. And I'm thinking about what he's going through. I see him there praying, and I wonder... I wonder, you know, when things are difficult in my life, I have people that I can call on, and they'll pray for me. I know you guys pray for me. And I, and I hope and I pray that you guys, all of you, have someone that when things are really intense in your life, when things are dark, when things are difficult, that you have someone that you can call on and say, I need you to pray with me, and I need you to pray for me. Uh, particularly when you can't pray anymore at all. If you've ever been to that place in your life, you're done. You've got nothing left. Your needle is all the way on E, but you've got somebody next to you that can pray for you and be there with you. You need somebody like that in your life. Because at that moment, at that moment, right where Jesus is now, in this garden, facing what he's about to face, Jesus says there's temptation in this garden. Now what is that temptation? When we're at that moment, where things are the most difficult, when things are the darkest, when things are the heaviest, when the weight of the world, so it seems, is upon us, because it's the weight of the world upon the shoulders of Christ here, when, it, when it's the weight of the world upon us in those darkest moments, what is the temptation? Well, perhaps, I, don't know, I can't tell you entirely what the temptation is that Jesus is speaking of here, but I can present this to you and say, Perhaps the temptation is to give up on God at this moment. People asked me that after Carol died. They said, are you going to give up on God now? And I said, quite the opposite, actually, for me. But they, but they asked me that in all honesty because that is either what they would do or they've seen others do the same thing. Look, I'll follow you, Lord, as long as it's not this difficult. But once it gets to be this difficult, I'm done. 
you know, I'll walk with you by the shores of Galilee. I'll watch you feed 5,000. That's awesome. I'll watch you raise the dead, but this whole garden thing is creeping me out a little bit here. You know, I'm, I'm willing to follow you anywhere except there. Is that what kind of Christianity you have? The Lord, you're good for me when times are good, but when times are bad, you know, I'm kind of done with you. Is that your Christianity? Is that your faith? This morning, is it any wonder that Jesus referred to his disciples more than once? Oh, you have little faith. Is that the size of your faith? That when things get hard, I'm done. I'm just giving up and I'm just walking away. There's temptation in that moment. When things are their most difficult, when things are the most heaviest, and the darkest in your life, there's temptation right there. And that temptation is to give up on God, to walk away from Him, or, or to turn back from His will. Lord, I know what Your will is in this moment. I just don't want to do it. There's a temptation right there in that moment to turn back on His will, or to avoid at all costs the cup that He holds out for me to drink from. Lord, I don't want to do this. That's not the point. Whether you want to do it or whether you don't want to do it is not the issue. The issue is what does God want you to do? What is the cup that God has given you to drink from? And are you willing to drink from it? Who wants to suffer? Well, nobody wants to suffer. I don't want to suffer. But what we're talking about here is we're talking about sacrifice. Remember that word. We're talking about sacrifice, not just suffering. Okay, let's go on with that. Point number two then. We're going to call this the struggle of sacrifice. Verses 41 to 44. He withdraws from them about a stone's throw and he knelt down and he prayed, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. Okay. Jesus leads his disciples to this garden. And he pauses and he tells them to pray that you may not enter into temptation. Then he takes his three closest friends deeper into the garden. And he pauses there for a moment. And then he walks on ahead of them. About a stone's throw. He goes into the garden. And he kneels down to pray. I don't know what the disciples were thinking at this moment. And much can be said about our physical posture in prayer. You know, what is the proper, proper posture in prayer? But when Jesus kneels down to pray, it makes me want to kneel down to pray. You ever kneel when you pray? You ever pray from laying on your face on the ground? Because your situation is so distinctively bad that you can hardly even sit up straight when you talk to the Lord. Kneeling is the posture of humble submission. Humble submission to get on your knees. That's a self-humiliation to kneel. But who are you kneeling before? Kneeling before God, Almighty God, your Creator. In Matthew chapter 26, there's some more details about this I wanted to refer to. Matthew chapter 26, verses 37 to 38. Matthew 26, picking up in verse 37, he took with them Peter and the sons of the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Sorrowful and deeply distressed. And then he said to them, he's speaking to Peter, James, and John, his three closest friends, this is what you say to your closest friends. You say stuff like this. He says to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here. Stay here, guys. Watch with me.
when we harmonize the accounts of the four different Gospels, we see that Jesus went a short distance away to pray alone. And as he did in that moment, that the full weight of what was before him comes down upon him. The weight of the world in that garden upon his shoulders. But when we see him praying, Lord, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. We, we don't see him struggling trying to decide if he was going to do it or if he wasn't going to do it. That's not the issue. Listen to what Alexander McLaren says about this moment. Um, he says, If the burden that crushed him thus was but the common load laid on all men's shoulders, he shows unmanly terror. If it were the black mass of the world's sins, we can understand the agony and rejoice to think that our sins were there. Do you see that? Do you see that as Jesus is grieved to the point, sorrowful unto death, when we see him say, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death, when we see him saying, if there's any other way to do this, Father, fine. If not, I'll do it your way. When we see him there, do you see Jesus facing what he's facing? His flesh, as he is human as well, recoiling from the horror of what he knows is going to happen. It's not a vain anticipation of what might happen. He knows precisely what's going to happen. Not only the physical torture that he will suffer, not only the physical uh, excruciating pain of being nailed onto the cross, but taking upon himself the sins of humanity. You see him in the garden facing the brutal torture and death that he's about to for your sins. For you. For what you have done. Not just this, oh, he's doing it for all of humanity. He's doing it for you. He's doing it for me. Do you see that? Do you see his, his heart heavy with the burden of your guilt? Do you see that? Because that's what it is. This, this isn't <coughs> Jesus in the garden saying, well, let's get this done and over with. Can't wait to get past this. Look at the grief of his soul, sorrowful unto death for the guilt of your sin. Do you have sin? Do you have guilt of your sin? This is him bearing it for you. Maybe even this morning, maybe even today, you know there's things going on in your life that should not be going on in your life. He grieved over that. He grieved over your disobedience. Your willful disobedience. Our sin, as I like to say, is we sin with impunity. He's grieving over that. What Jesus is doing here is called sacrifice. That's what it is. Oh, yeah, yeah, we know sacrifice for our sins. Listen to the definition of the word. Definition of the word, the word sacrifice is the act of giving up something valued for the sake of something else regarded as more important or worthy. You get that? The act of giving up something valued for the sake of something else regarded as more important or worthy. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 2, very familiar passage. I know you guys all read your Bible. So we are encouraged, of course, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, to, as it says in verse 2, look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. But listen to this about this moment. Who, think about Jesus, he's in the garden, he's on his knees and he's praying. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. For the joy that was set before him. It's often been said, and I tend to agree with it, that the joy that was set before him is you. He did this for you. 
in that garden. Did he picture you, his mind, in the garden? I think so. He's bearing upon himself the sin of the world. You're in the world. You're part of that. Jesus knew what you would do before you were ever even born. Jesus knew what you've been doing this last week. He knew what you did this morning. He knows what you're going to do today, tonight, tomorrow. And the weight, the grief of that is upon him heavily. But for the joy of what it would bring about, he was willing to do what he did for you and for me. In Hebrew, or, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, uh, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. Is that what I said? Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. God's Word says this to you and to me. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given Himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. This kind of sacrifice for you and for me was to God a sweet-smelling aroma. Another very familiar passage, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, that literally means your whole self. Not just part of you, not just your flesh, your whole self, in every possible conceivable way, shape, and form. Present your whole self a living sacrifice, dying daily, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's a reasonable thing. To give to God your whole self, because Christ certainly gave his whole self. Why does sacrifice smell good to God? As Ephesians 5.2 says, why does sacrifice smell good to God? Well, I think sacrifice is the act of giving up something valued for the sake of something more valuable. And when we do that in our lives every single day, when we sacrifice things that are important to us, or even valuable to us, for the sake of obedience to God, and His will and His plan. What we do is, when we do that, we align ourselves with God's will. We come into step with Him. That smells good to God. Which maybe means the inverse, which is when we're out of step, or out of alignment with the will of God. We stink up the joint. So when we align ourselves with God's will, when we align ourselves with the pattern of Christ, when we align ourselves with His purpose, which is the making us into the image of His Son, that submission to God's will smells good to Him. And I don't want to be stinking up the throne room of God. It's the fragrance of humility and the recognition of who we are submitting to. You understand that? You understand who's asking you to do this? Who's asking you to get aligned with His plan and His purpose? It's God. It's not your husband, it's not your wife, it's not your pastor. Or some other significant person. It's God who is asking you to do this. More than that, it's God who is commanding you to do this. But oh, is that ever a struggle? Is that ever a struggle? Remember, there's temptation in this garden. That is such a struggle because... Jesus in his humanity feels the weight of the struggle, even here in the garden. He understands the weight of the struggle. Father, if it's your will, take this cup from me. He understands the weight of it. But even bearing up and experiencing in his humanity the weight of this decision, the weight of this sacrifice, he never winced, he never hesitated in his steps forward, but felt the weight of what he was about to bear. So is it heavy? Is it weighty? Yes, of course it is. Absolutely. So much so, 
that this grief of his soul, the sorrowful unto death, the weight of what he was about to experience caused a very rare medical condition, and it's a factual medical condition, and the blood vessels underneath his skin bursting. So he's sweating as it is, sweat, not only the sweat, but blood as well. So aligning yourself with God's purpose is it's not easy because your flesh recoils from it. Because I want to do what I want to do. Even to the extent where I'm going to comb through God's Word daily trying to find the loophole that I can leap through. So I can do what I want to do and somehow justify it. God's asking you for sacrifice. For sacrifice. Not this, Lord, I'll do what you want as long as it agrees with me. Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus didn't say, Father, find another way. But what he did say is, not my will, but yours be done. I will do what you command me to do. I will do what must be done since there is no other way. And alignment with the purpose and the will of God is the right way, and it's the only way. The other way stinks up the place. Listen again to Alexander McLaren. Such conformity of our wills with God's is the highest blessing of prayer and true deliverance. The cup accepted is sweet, and though the flesh may shrink, the inner self consents, and in consenting to the pain, conquers it. Nobody talks like that anymore. In accepting or in consenting to the pain, conquers it. Is what God's asking me to do difficult? Is what God commands me to do difficult? Yes, of course it's difficult. But in consenting to do it is the victory. Sometimes for us, I know it's true for me, the anticipation is far worse than the actual thing itself. I just went in and had a whole bunch of dental work done. And... Uh, I really, really have an intense dislike of going to the dentist. Uh, it runs in my family. It's a, like a genetic predisposition to panic or something. I don't know. But I, when, I, when I go into the dentist, I just I have all of this anxiety about going in. And every once in a while, I think, you know, I'm, gonna go, I'm just going to have gasp. You know, just, just put me under, then you can do what you want. You know, I, I'd much rather take anesthesia than this, you know. And, and so I get myself all worked up, and I, you know, I went in and I had to have a whole bunch of stuff done because I'd been saving it up for a long time. And um, man, you know, I was just, oh, oh. and I was just, you know, kind of hyperventilating a little bit, just getting myself all worked up. And I got a great dentist to ask Barbara. I got a great dentist, great guy. And you don't want really good. <laughs> you know, even all, I had to have like three different injections of Novocaine into my mouth and as numb from the neck up. And, but you know what? It went really, really well. So what was the worst part of the whole thing? It was the anticipation. It was me getting, getting myself all twisted up. In it. And oftentimes God's will is like that. The anticipation of it. There's the worst part. Oh, I really don't want to do this. I don't want to fight through this. I don't want to have to do what God's telling me to do, even though I know it's the right thing to do. I want to do what I want to do. And I struggle with that. And in that moment, I've got those struggles from the garden again. Pray that you may not enter into temptation because I'm really tempted right now to take what appears to me to be the, the right way or the easy way out. So much easier just to drop that whole thing and go on a whole other direction. God says, no, no. No, we're going to go through the knot hole backwards. That's what we're going to do. That's what I've determined us to do here today. And you say, I, I, can't, I can't fit through that. He says, oh, yeah. We look at what's ahead and say, Lord, I can't do that. And he says, yeah, you can. Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. How about those long-term trials, friends? I don't want to do this anymore. God says, oh, yeah, you will. I can't do this anymore. Yeah, you can. I don't want to. You need to. I'd rather. No, you don't want to do it. It's temptation in the garden. Right at that moment, the most critical moment of all, 
when your decision is going to turn determine, though it may not be your eternal destiny, it may certainly be your temporal destiny. When really in that moment you're holding not only your own life, but the lives of people around you that care about you and love you in the palm of your hand. Because you don't suffer alone. Everybody around you is going to suffer with your decision too. Stupid things that I've done, everybody around me suffered. I make everyone so there's no victim in this crime. So I choose to disobey God, and everyone around me suffers. I choose to obey God, I may suffer, and others will see me walking in alignment with God's purpose and will. Thus, glorifying God, showing God to be who He is to the world around me. When I take the temptation in the garden to run the other way. What do people see in me? What do they see? They, they see someone who claimed to believe, but when things really got tough, decided he really didn't. They see someone who, who said all the right things at all the right times, but you know, really when it came right down to it, it really didn't work out for or, or, yeah, you know, I really thought, you know, Brian was made of better stuff than that, but, you know, I guess not. He chose to give up and take his own way out, whatever that may be. You see, the struggle here at this moment, in this garden, this moment of struggle, that, that's okay. The, the struggle is not the issue. Because a struggle is a sign of life, right? The struggle is a sign of life. Because a dead fish floats downstream. It's the live fish that swims against the, against the current, right? So the struggle, that, that's a sign of life. That's okay. And, and you and I are going to struggle at this point. That's okay. It's okay to struggle because Jesus died to pay the price for our failures to do His will. Now, it's never an excuse to say, well, I'm just going to go ahead and do what I want anyway. Jesus died for this. Are you willing to put Him through that? Are you willing to take advantage of what Jesus did for you? Are you willing to treat His sacrifice like that? Look at Him in the garden, on His knees, sweating drops of blood, and you want to take advantage of that? By saying, I'm just going to do my own thing anyways, I know Jesus died for it anyway, so I'll just get forgiven. Are you willing to do that to Him? For what He did for you? Thirdly, and lastly, the victory is gained. The victory is gained. And I see the victory there in verse 45. He rose up from prayer. Victory gained. He's up, he's on his feet, and he's walking out of the garden now. He knows what's coming, right? You know what's coming? The mob to arrest him. He's on his feet, he's walking out of the garden. Now, verse 43, it said that an angel from heaven came to comfort him. <clears throat> Maybe God sent the angel to comfort him because his disciples weren't. Where are the three? Sleeping. Harmonizing again the four different gospel accounts from Matthew chapter 26, 39 to 46, we see that three times Jesus had gone a stone's throw from these three men to pray and come back each time to find them sleeping. Mark 14, 37, each time he comes back, there they, there's the three sleeping. And, it, and admittedly, it, it says here in verse 45 of Luke 22, uh, they were sleeping from sorrow. They see what Jesus is going through, but that sorrow causes them to sleep. I can tell you, sorrow will cause you to be very, very tired. And it was at this moment that he says to these three, to these three now, he says, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 26, 41. Friends, when you're at this moment where the decision is to be made, your flesh is going to be weak. Your flesh is going to recoil from making the right decision. Every fiber in your being is going to recoil from making the decision that you know you must if you're going to be aligned with the purpose of God. 
spirit inside of you says, oh yes, I know it's the right thing to do. But your flesh is going to go, ah, oh, no you don't. You think that's not a struggle? At this moment, Jesus wanted their companionship the most they were asleep. I wonder too, how many opportunities to comfort someone else you and I have missed because we've just been spiritually asleep at the wheel. You know, we knew somebody else was going through something and we just looked the other way and walked on. We, we, we were so spiritually sleepy that we didn't go, oh wow, this is an opportunity for me to comfort them with the comfort that somebody else has comforted me with before. How long does it take to stop and to pray for somebody? Or to just say something to them like, you know what, it, anything, I'm, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. I'm not asleep. I'm here for you. Whatever it is that, that you may need. I wonder how many opportunities we miss because we were sleeping spiritually. Or because we just weren't paying attention. Or, or worse, that we were the ones that were suffering and we never called anybody to tell them that we're suffering. We do that, don't we? Maybe we can call that another temptation from the garden. Of not calling on somebody else and saying, Hey, pray for me. I'm going through some really, really difficult stuff here. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't. You, you can say, well, my difficulty is just so minor compared with other people's difficulty. That, that doesn't matter. It's your difficulty. It's, it's, it's huge to you. I don't care what it is compared to anybody else, this is your suffering. And to not call on the people that are closest to you for prayer, this is your church family. This is what we're here for. This is what I'm here for. To call and say, please pray for me. Are you kidding? I live for stuff like that. It's to have somebody call and say, pray for me. Don't don't suffer alone. Well, I don't want to bother anyone. Please, don't think that. It is not a bother to people that love you, to pray for you, and to be concerned about you. I don't want to bother anyone. Don't, please don't say that to me. Because I'm just not going to take that. Don't say I didn't want to bother anybody. Bother me. I'm telling you now. Bother me. Can we all say that to each other? Bother me. Bother me. Okay? This is what we're here for. Don't suffer alone. So, with Jesus, with the dread, the dread, the physical revulsion of torture, and crucifixion immediately before him, Jesus warns his disciples, this is no time to sleep. This is dangerous ground that you're on here. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. This is no time to snooze. you got to pay attention at this moment, this critical juncture, where you have to make this massive decision about, am I going to obey God or am I not going to obey God? Do I want God's will to be done and I'm going to walk that way? Or am I going to do my will and walk that way? Right at that moment, the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. And you've got to pray. And you need people around you that are praying for you. When you and I face times of trial, when we're struggling with this acquiescence to God's will, when we face a sacrifice that our flesh recoils from, it's a dangerous, dangerous time. Why? Because in that moment, in that exact moment, when you have to make that decision, every alternative in the universe is going to come flooding into your head. You're going to come up with a thousand reasons why you should go off and do your own thing and not do the will of God. And they're going to be good reasons, too. They're going to be creative. They're going to be amazing. And you say, well, I could do, I never thought of that. I could just do this over here. And your spirit is saying, that's not where God's leading you. That's not the will of God for you. The will of God for you is obedience to his word. 
every conceivable and creative way to avoid God's will is going to come flooding into your mind. You're going to, you're going to have a million excuses for why you can and should refuse to take that cup that he's holding out to you. That cup is obedience, acquiescence, humble submission, sacrifice to the will of God. You're going to have a thousand reasons why. It's here that the dread of doing God's will is the greatest, not because God's will is dreadful, far be it, but because our flesh resists any will but our own. Our flesh resists any will but our own. Our flesh wants our way. And our flesh is going to press upon us every conceivable weight, every conceivable argument against the will of God. See, the burden is not in doing God's will. God's Word says it's, it's a joy to obey Him. The, the struggle, the suffering, is in the anticipation of doing it. It's like going to the dentist. The, the dental work is no big deal. Doing God's word, it's a joy, it's a pleasure. So why do I have this struggle? In the choosing, I'm not even doing it yet. I'm just choosing. Why this struggle? Just in the choosing, doing God's will. Because our flesh resists any will but its own. And so as our flesh wants to do its own thing, God's saying, no, my will is good. It's good. So, do you feel the dread of giving up something precious to yourself for the sake of doing God's will? Do you feel that? Have you ever felt that? If you haven't, you will. Do you feel the dread of giving up something precious to you, giving up your will, your plans, your ideas, your agendas, your issues? Do you feel the, the, the dread of giving those up for the sake of doing God's will? Do you feel that dread? Good. You should feel that dread. But it's at that moment that we lay down our own will for His. It's at that moment where in prayer we come to God and we lay it down. Jesus looked straight into the darkness of bearing the mass of the world's sin upon His shoulders. He looked straight into that darkness and He said, I'll do it. I'll do it. This is what has to be done. I'll do it. God's answer to Jesus was that there is no other way for these people, for you to be reconciled to Him. You have to do it this way. It's the only way. And Jesus says, I'll do it. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that God made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. He made Christ to bear that load. Jesus' answer to His prayer was not the removal of the burden, but the strength to bear the load. God says, this is what I want you to do. Jesus says, I'll do it. An angel comes to him, and I don't know what the angel says. The angel says, you know what's ahead of you, but you know the joy that's set before you as well. And Jesus says, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll take upon myself the mass, the inconceivable mass of the darkness, of the sin of the world, of your sin. The, the mass of the darkness of your sin. He says, I'll take that upon myself. And then the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. What kind of power is that? That says, I'll take upon myself the mass of the world's sin. So, so just for a moment, in closing, just look for a minute. Just look for a minute. Just try for a minute and look and see Jesus as He rises up from prayer and He walks back to His three disciples. There's blood and sweat pouring down from His face. And He's now ready to face the greatest and the most heartbreaking sacrifice that the world has ever seen. He is about to do something that no one else could ever do. Just look at him. Look at him kneeling in the garden and pouring out his soul to God. And look at him.
coming back to his disciples, soaked in sweat and blood. After he said, I'll do it. I'll do it. Again, from Alexander McLaren, he says, his will never wavered but maintained itself supreme over the natural recoil of his human nature from pain and death. If he had not felt the cross to be a dread, it would have been no sacrifice. If he had allowed the dread to penetrate his will, he would have been no savior. It's at that moment, at that moment, where in prayer we lay down our will, to His, we sacrifice our will for His in that moment, in that place of greatest temptation, in that garden, even to the sweating of blood, in that moment we lay down our will. And we say, Lord, I'll do it. I'll do it. What I want to see is that what he suffers in making that sacrifice, he suffered from me. <coughs> what he's doing here, those great drops of blood, and he's sweating, that great mass of sin that he's dreading, that's mine. It's me there. That's Jesus kneeling there in the garden. That's mine sin that he's grieving over. All my sin, past, present, and future. But in the laying down of my will for his, it's no sacrifice really, but it's our highest joy. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, again, for the joy that was set before him. It's a joy to do the will of God, but it's this moment in the garden that's the greatest struggle. It's that moment well, we have to lay down our own will to take up His. That's the greatest struggle. So what do we do? We look unto Jesus, Hebrews 12, 2, the author and the finisher of our faith, because He did this. He did this for my sin. He did this for you. Can you do any less when you do it by the strength and the power of His might in you? When you make that decision, you know that Jesus already made that decision for you. So can you make this decision? Yeah. Now, then, when we look at him in that garden, we look at him on his knees, praying, sweating, and bleeding. And then we look at us, because as he's on his knees, praying, sweating, and bleeding, we're asleep. There we are. Asleep. But knowing that Jesus did this for you. And when you see that, then sacrificing your will for His will become just a little bit easier. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, how can we comprehend the weight of our sin, the weight of my sin, upon your shoulders in this moment. How can we comprehend that? Much less the sin of all humanity on your shoulders. So Lord, many of us, perhaps even all of us, even this day, even this morning, have decisions to make about following your will or not following your will. And it's a struggle. Jesus, it's a struggle. And you know the struggle, Jesus. So I, I, I know that you know it. I, and I know that I'm not telling you anything you don't know about, Lord, but it's a, it's a struggle. Because my flesh is strong. Lord, you know my spirit is willing. I want to do it, Lord. But now, Lord, what I, what I need is I need that same strength of the Lord and the power of your might that you had in that moment in the garden. I need that now, Lord, that I can make the decision that I 
two like you can rise up from prayer there in the garden and go out there and face my accusers and my arresters and my torturers and tormentors. Lord, to face whatever it is out there that you have for me with joy, knowing, Lord, that it's your will. Lord, how, how, could, I, how could I refuse? How could I even possibly hesitate for a moment to refuse? So Lord, grant us now that great and that awesome power, Lord, to go out there and to make those decisions, Lord, and not to give in to the temptation that's in the garden, Lord, but to take up the strength and the power of your will that you demonstrated in the garden and now impart to us. Lord Jesus, how can we not thank you? How can we not praise you? How can we not just give it all over to you in this moment? Even as we're praying this morning, there are some of you that are in the midst of things right now and you need to make the right decision. You are tinkering with the wrong decisions. You have entertained the wrong decisions and you are prepared to make bad decisions that are going to affect everyone around you. Lord Jesus, you know every I don't know everybody in this room, Lord. I don't know everybody that intimately. Lord Jesus, but you do. So I pray that you'd speak to each one of our hearts, Lord Jesus. That we would lay down our will for yours. Lord, move and work on hearts this morning to do that. To convict. You showed us what sacrifice is, Lord. Now I pray that we wouldn't be afraid of it. But take up the joy that comes from following hard after you and your example. Grant us that strength and that power even now, Lord, that we could uh, enjoy the pleasure of walking in obedience to you, fragrancing heaven with a, with a wonderful smell, not stinking up the joint like usual. Grant us grace to do this, the power that comes from you, Lord. We offer up ourselves to you as best as we can now, Lord. Grant us the grace to make that sacrifice. For we ask it from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.